hope, um, hope you can hear me and see this section. This is what I'm going to be talking about first. So the exhibition begins, perhaps um, unusually, with not those most celebrated or um, typical dresses that one thinks of when one thinks of Palestinian embroidery. Because when you do, you think of these spectacular wedding and celebration dresses that women would have embroidered for specific special occasions, such as their wedding. And we have many of them, hundreds of them inside. But I wanted to begin the tour with, and the exhibition with, um, with what we call everyday dresses, a much simpler, more quotidian garment that a woman would have worn really on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're talking here about the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Embroidery is very much a rural craft. It's really connected to women's um, sort of dynamic and productive life in agriculture and in the village. And what you see in these dresses, I think they're amazing, is that although they may not seem to be as perfect, as special as the ones inside, they actually hold and contain a host of histories and traces. They become a kind of index of women's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So what you see is that in the very garments, they've become kind of palimpsestic. Here, for instance, a woman has made holes so that she can breastfeed her babies through the dress and then sewn them up again once the children were weaned. She's, uh, she's made patches on her knees, perhaps you can think about her sitting in a certain way to, uh, to wash clothes or to prepare food, and over time, wet hands on dry fabric has kind of worn away those threads. Sometimes you can tell that the, the colour of the, of the linen, the linen is dyed with indigo, is different in places. So she's replaced it in certain moments with newer material. She's used perhaps um, old shirts of her husband to shore up the underarms. These garments become these kind of mosaic-like palimpsestic objects that essentially change and transform with the life of their maker. Of course, they also reflect the specificities of a woman's village and her own um, personality. You know, those motifs and the decisions she makes about the patterns and what it is that she inscribes on her dress are particular to where she comes from. And that's explored very much in this forest section. You can really understand this region by region. But here, these also have this amazing effect of introducing us somehow to how all embroidery can be read as something that's intimate and transformative. You know, when we work in museums, especially with this kind of material and Palestinian cultural heritage under threat, we have this impulse to lock things into time and space. We want to think of things as singular historic objects. But these entirely evade that kind of reading because you can imagine a woman starting with one dress and then over time she adds patches and layers and patches and changes things and if by the end it's become an entirely different dress materially and yet it's still the same object. So the idea that embroidery is something that transforms and shifts with the life of its maker is an idea that's really crucial to me and runs throughout the exhibition as a whole. And you can see throughout, you will see dresses and then on these rails, um, contextualizing images, things from the time, drawn from different archives that help to place this in a, in a particular kind of context. So this section of the exhibition, this first part, is looking closely at gender and understandings of how embroidery has intersected gendered ideals and ideas uh, of womanhood, particularly in Palestine over time. And what you'll see in the central vitrine, from this side anyway, is the way in which embroidery was somehow integrated into the, the life cycle, as I put it, of a rural Palestinian woman in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And of course, before that, you have this adorable little like baby's dress at the end. You know, little girls would be taught by their mothers, their aunts, uh, their sisters, from the age of five or six. They would be sent out to gather the eggs from their family farms and would sell these to buy their first spools of thread and practice embroidery under their, their mother's guidance. Embroidery was something that became a particularly important ritual um, in the rite of passage that is marriage. Women would work for years to build a trousseau and uh, like a chest of dresses and cushions and things that would carry them into married life. And the wedding dress was really a key high point of this. Um, what you see also in this little section on the end is on the left, um, well, let's start with on the right, actually, if you think of this uh, of women making dresses 
to carry them into marriage. This dress is interesting because it also bears the mark of different hands. It's not only are these objects not necessarily tied to time and space, but they're also not necessarily tied to one maker. What you see in this dress that requires a bit of close looking is that maybe it was created by two sisters and they were more or less good at embroidery. So if you look at the vanilla, these like side panels, one side, I think on the right, is super neat and fastidious, and the other one a little bit less so. You see that the, the motifs are a bit more stretched, the stitches aren't quite as fine, and what you would find is that women would help each other, basically, to, to finish their dresses, especially if the wedding was being prepared in a rush. At a certain point during the Ottoman Empire, uh, being married meant you could evade um, national service if you were a man. So people would get married quickly, and then you'd have like the whole family rushing to help you embroider um, your dresses. Here on the left, a dress that uh, is owned by a widow, was made by a widow, you see a much more restrained palette and a sense of embroidery, embroidery carrying women and reflecting maturity and a late stage of their life. And colour did this very much too. The darker the indigo, I mean, that was on the one hand a sign of wealth and status, but it was also a sign of restrained mourning. And women who had lost someone in their family would dye their bright embroidery uh, with indigo, dye it dark blue, dampening down its colours. And only as those colours reappeared after years of washing would she be kind of re-entering the world and ready for love again. And you know, the use of blue is also indicative of that, and when red reappears in a dress, she's sort of ready again for, for a relationship. So on the one hand, that's sort of what this is doing, is mapping this connection very much to gendered rituals and rites of passage. But I was also interested in this very clear imbrication of uh, the embroidered woman, as I put it, the kind of woman's body and the embroidered dress as a key symbol in the articulation of national heritage, particularly after 1948 and the Nakba. And what you find is that this, at a moment when, of course, Palestinian, um, Palestinian lives, Palestinian statehood was absolutely under threat, destroyed and conflict was uh, ripping people apart, you had this concerted effort, not only sort of politically but on the ground, to re-establish um, a, a claim to, to statehood and to longevity and embroidery and the, the women wearing embroidery became a key sort of symbol in this vocabulary of heritage. And what's interesting about these images is on the one hand, they provide a certain power to, to women, right, who had very little in the way of kind of political visibility at this moment. These, again, are rural women. They are not necessarily the people who are participating in the daily political life of Palestine. And here they are, writ large in images. We're showing work by Nabil Aneni, Abdul Hayy Salam, Aysan Badr, who was looking at motifs, uh, Vera Tamari, Simal Mansour, and um, Abdul Rahman Muzayyan. And what you see in these images is on the one hand this celebration of women and what it is they do, but on the other there tends to be a flattening and a, a reductivity that's going on in the way they're presented. I mean, this image by Simal Mansour is among the most powerful and famous in Palestinian art history. It's called Birthing the Nation. On the one hand, you see this woman there, large, she's taken over the space, she's doing something extraordinary. Uh, she, you know, from her body are rushing forth men to toil the land, to, pr like, to produce culture, uh, to be productive in agriculture, and her body becomes somehow flattened and contiguous with the space of the village, right? She is one and the same with this broader architecture. You could argue, of course, that mother ha motherhood has a certain potency and agency, but that ultimately she becomes this sort of secondary symbolic character in this space. And in this painting by Nabil Anani, you know, these are being made from really the 1970s onwards, but this is from 2013, and many of these artists continue to work in this vein. You see a woman conflated with this other key symbol of Palestinian nationhood and history, uh, the city, the city of Jerusalem. And she's not just holding it up or supporting it or has it on her shoulder, as is common tropes, but it's literally running right through her chest. I mean, it's truly intervening in her very body. It's kind of cutting her. As soon as you see this, you, or I perceive it as kind of violent, actually. And her dress, right, the space which would have held embroidery that she would have designed, that would have come purely from her mind, her, would have reflected her personality, her concerns, has been emptied out and used as a vehicle for other signs of rurality, as though to reinforce the message that Palestinians have 
uh, have history, have, you know, have a heritage, have um, longevity in this space, all of which are important themes, but which are done at the expense, really, of this particular woman's personality. Embroidery on its own is not really considered strong enough or potent enough symbolically to speak for itself. So this sort of um, kind of co-option and transformation of the female body through embroidery in the service of particular kinds of symbolic ends is something I think that's really important because it goes on to, to affect so much of what comes later. And we'll see that in the next section too, where these are circulated as images on posters very frequently. Embroidery, uh, we have here the kinds of uh, clothing that men would have worn in this period and pieces that the women in their lives would have embroidered for them. I find particularly fascinating this little pouch but we, we couldn't exactly work out what it was for, and then we realized that it was for a transistor radio that shepherds would have carried in the fields to listen to as they were working. There's tobacco pouches and things like this. And as you can see, the, the exhibition is the result of years of field work. I spent a lot of time interviewing women who embroidered it today um, all over the region, in Palestine, Lebanon, and Jordan. And these interviews, uh, just one or two minute clips, are all over the show. Please, uh, please listen to them. Something that I asked a lot was, and what do the men in your life do? Do the men embroider? No. I, I don't see a lot of this. And they say, oh God, yeah, of course they do. My husband, he helps me out a great deal. Uh, when I'm cooking, he'll take up my work, or my son loves it, it's his hobby. They just don't like to talk about it. But, so there's clearly men doing this, but while it isn't necessarily licit or socially appropriate for men to kind of own this practice in public, in the space of the prison, men embroider with great pride. So as political prisoners in Israeli prisons, we found and did a series of interviews with, with men who, um, who embroidered in these contexts, you find these really extraordinary embroidered objects, and that's what we see here. And they're amazing not only because they're produced under extremely difficult conditions, you had long periods where you weren't allowed materials in prisons, so people were taking threads out of towels or from their clothing, dyeing them chemically with medicine they could take in the Red Cross room, um, finding ways to whittle the pips from olives or whatever it might be. Really extraordinary work that attests to the realities under which they were living. But they're also wonderful because they claim an allegiance, of course, to national struggle and they're powerful political objects. But they also are indicative of a real tenderness and love. You find men all the time making things for their wives, their mothers, their sisters, for International Women's Day, for Mother's Day. And you see that very much in this. So this idea that embroidery is either women's work, something, uh, a term that's considered derogatory in a way of marginalizing, marginalizing it, or is something that's totally emasculating for men, isn't really the reality. That actually the way that we gender these objects um, is relational, not intrinsic to them. And I think these pieces are, are particularly beautiful for that. So I did that anyone can embroider, and that embroidery serves this political purpose in Palestine in all the three contexts. So what you see in this section is this kind of continuation of that painting practice uh, that is explored on the opposite wall. We see in a moment in the 70s and 80s really the explosion of printed matter and of this idea of the gendered woman and embroidery as a symbol becoming circulated far and wide on posters. And posters were cheap to produce, easy to distribute. They were things that people rushed to own and were happy to own really as works of art in their home. And uh, all the artists that I mentioned before and graphic designers took this up really as a key symbol in that vocabulary of nationalism. And embroidery breaks away really from women's bodies as well and becomes a kind of surface of its own. And embroidery as a surface is something I find interesting. I think it becomes something on which we project ideals of, of womanhood over time uh, in Palestine. In this period, the 70s and 80s, for the PLO, it was particularly important that embroidery was used among other cultural practices as a way of asserting nationhood and uh, claims to history. And what you found is that embroidery travelled all over the world. Uh, it was collected and uh, travelled to different exhibitions, uh, particularly in Europe, Eastern Europe, um, and Soviet states, under the auspices of the Arts and Cultural Heritage section of the PLO, run by Tanana Akhad and this nation of artists. They toured these exhibitions. This is an interview with Tanana, and you can see some images um, of these shows over here in the walls. 
And they were amazing in that they, um, they took embroidery out in these different contexts. They went to Warsaw and to, uh, to East Germany, to Spain, and they often became the backdrop to high profile political meetings. So you see Yasser Arafat meeting the King of Spain, handing over an embroidered dress to his wife, the Queen, as it was a grand gesture, and the embroidery is in the background performing this kind of soft diplomacy form of cultural and political diplomacy, and this is something that's addressed in the other book in a text by, uh, by Christine Poole. So embroidery at this point is, is traveling, is moving, is taking on all of this symbolic and cultural weight uh, from Palestine and applying it to this broader political activity that the PLO is advanced in. And you see, if you listen here, you listen to music that's produced in this period, you can see um, examples of Devki and dance that's performed in costume and embroidery being embodied really again in this sort of politicized version of heritage. Towards the end of the 1980s, with the first Intifada, you have produced some of what I think are the most extraordinary objects in the exhibition. Please come close and look at them because um, I think they're particularly amazing. These are what we call Intifada dresses. So they were produced at this moment um, during the first Intifada when very oppressive and difficult conditions, and being on the front line of protest on the war, women and men also, but uh, people found themselves having their Palestinian flags confiscated and couldn't show Palestinian colours in public when this was, was illegal. So women started to stitch instead these explicit symbols of nationalism and political pride onto their very dresses. And then more in protest, but these could not be removed from the body. And what's amazing about them is that uh, when we think of protest, we think of something immediate and spontaneous, the school sign, the graffiti poster, something we do on the spot. But anyone who's ever avoided will know that it's a really slow and laborious process. And partly this woman is here to kind of remind us of that throughout the show. Here's the woman's removing her canvas after she's finished her embroidery itself. So these dresses would have been months, years in the making, and for me they therefore embody the, the sort of the, the steadfastness of, uh, of the Palestinian struggle, the extended nature of the Intifada, and the kind of prolonged character of, of all of the And the, the rest of the section is looking a bit at how these kinds of motifs, how the embroidery was instrumentalized. Um, Inherited organizations that appear over those in the system. And we're also starting, of course, to walk through the, the forest dresses, which are organized in terms of region. And it's important to me when I'm curating these sections to, of course, try to cover as much of Palestine as possible, but also to break a little bit this idea that's often um, when, when we publish these things has just the one dress that is the body of Yaffa and another dress that is from Khalil and another one that is from Kazin. When actually, of course, um, despite regional characteristics and, and village characteristics, every woman creates something different. So you see here, for instance, two dresses from Sahih, side by side, but at first one they look the same, you can tell the name from the same village, but as soon as you get closer, you can see somehow the handwriting of each individual woman and how it is that she approached this, made this, her, her, her literal skill, her sensibilities, her way of working. And thinking about embroidery in this kind of nuanced complex way is a big, really important um, and continue to problematize and think critically about this material. And what's happening in here because uh, this whole section is really dedicated to the idea of embroidery as symbolism. If anyone wants to know more really about the specificities of motifs, what they meant, how they were used on different dresses in different contexts, um, this is where there's information on both sides. So you can look at the palm tree motif, recognize it on the dress, and understand it in different contexts, being connected to what women saw. You know, when women saw things in architecture, when they saw things um, in nature, food that they were preparing, things they were eating, all of this ended up being translated, either more naturalistically or geometrically, onto their dresses. They become these records of people's lives at a certain moment, uh, as, well, as well as their individual.
characters. And it's interesting the way that the, the sort of travel of these symbols is dependent or reliant upon um, modernity. Right? As soon as cars and buses were introduced into Palestine in the late 20s and the early 30s, people were able to travel much further afield than before. Because if before you were just going to market locally in a town that you can reach, you were only seeing women with similar kinds of dresses and you're competing to see who's got the most interesting designs. But as soon as you can go further away, you're suddenly encountering people from all these different regions. And women would maybe spot a motif on someone's dress, commit it to memory, rush home and embroider it, maybe forget a couple of things in the process and come up with a whole new motif they've given a new name, and it becomes a new tradition in their village. So the modernity and, and the kind of technology of travel, let's say, has an effect on, on embroidery, and embroidery is connected to these kinds of dynamics. Okay, um, so this, this section, so having looked through the agenda, and that embroidery is this kind of symbol, this key potent symbol that can circulate in different contexts, and taken on these fresh and criticized roles, it was very interesting to me to look at how embroidery has intersected labor. This is partly how the title of the exhibition came out, right? Labor of Love is intended to reflect that emotional um, connection that so many of us in Palestine have to embroidery, but it's also meant to acknowledge and address the fact that in the end, embroidery is work, actually painting and work at times, uh, exhausting and long and difficult, and thinking about the histories of labor, and embroidery's connection to economies in Palestine was really key to my work here. Because what you see on this wall when you move around is embroidery's commodification today. You know, we see embroidery everywhere, we wear it, uh, yes, me has on a, a lovely vest, a little waistcoat, we've all got um, bags or accessories, earrings, shoes, and we all have this stuff. I've got more than this than I can, uh, than I can sort of do. And I was interested in how we got there, right? How did we shift from a practice that's inherently personal, that's made by the woman for herself alone, very much part of her day-to-day -day life in agriculture, and get to this sort of mass commodification of this practice? And in part, that meant going back and understanding that, of course, the world has always been connected to a market for sale. Even before the Nakba, you have objects that are being made for local markets. But left hand for instance, had a really strong cottage industry. So you see sometimes this is a dress from a beard, right, on the end. But it's got these sleeves that if you look behind you in the second section, you'll see are specific to that. And this style of couching, this kind of three-dimensional sculpting in the this is couching on the way. This is the Tibetan. And women from other areas started to catch on to this trend and became fashionable at some point. And they would go and have special sleeves made in Bethlehem style for their own wedding dresses. Or a groom would go and have this made for his bride and with when she's preparing her wedding clothes. You see pieces that are made for markets. Some of these are specifically made for a tourist market, local like pilgrims. You find sort of embroidered pieces with Bethlehem and Jerusalem written in English. So they're inevitably for people coming to visit the Holy Land. And you see the fabrics themselves reflecting these kinds of histories. So these fabrics, please feel free to touch them and play with their texture. These are all examples of the kinds of fabrics that were circulating in the late 19th century, mostly um, woven in Aleppo and Damascus and coming down with their shanks into, uh, into Palestine, which was all Ottoman then, but were also produced uh, in Palestine as well, and particularly in Gaza, this famous for. And even if we look at our clothing, what we're wearing today, it will tell us something about the history of agriculture, the growth of cotton, the international trade, economies of sale, and understanding some of these fabrics and seeing them in the dresses helps tie these objects to this broader fabric of dynamics. In the British mandate, you see uh, British made cotton and furry style checks appearing uh, in these like eye catching positions inside uh, jackets. So these became status symbols, expensive pieces that you would buy to show the But it was really after 1948 that it would have shifted definitively from a practice that was labor but not paper into something that was always done for a wage. And this is because, of course, after 1948, the women were displaced from their homes, living in diaspora, and then refugee camps in the villages inside the West Bank. In conditions and they're entirely divorced from their original lives in agriculture and from those 
networks, those markets for sale, they were impoverished, um, and in need of employment, they need of support. And organisations such as the National Strike were set up really to provide them with the opportunity to avoid the pain. And it was these kinds of organisations, not just in Ash, but Sandy, in the Union, Ash, and the Union, others like it, that started to introduce this work to them and give them a life to them. All of which I think was, was great. Sandy is particularly interested in articulating this labour as something that is right? But if we read these kinds of things, Sandy set up these big factories and uh, allowed women to work in different contexts, and they were making farm, they were farming, they were making new books about this and they really considered the employers' abilities with a new employment, contributing just as much to the Palestinian struggle as the fight of the Islam or the kind of industrial work that the Haitians have the militarization of the and its sudden generation of capital, I think, pushed forward this shift in the continuing politicization of this material and its ultimate modification. What you see is that women started to mix together in the camps from different villages, so they were suddenly exposed to each other, and the globe itself started to homogenize in its form, and women had access to different kinds of material, synthetic fabrics. It takes a very bold woman to wear lime green and orange, and I agree with Salisa. And I think that these kinds of pieces are indicative of a set of boldness and innovation in the way that women were working. This velvet piece, you actually roll down the sleeves, and they're like traditional pointed in their sleeves, but then you pull them up, and they become these like fashionable puff shoulders. So whatever works in the 80s. This object, particularly, is amazing or has a special story in that it's, uh, it's addressed from Roma, and it was given to another woman, another woman, sorry, after the Nakba, who had come into Roma, uh, had to leave her home, and maybe had nothing with her except the clothes on her back. And one woman donated this to her, but you can see that the woman she gave it to was taller, maybe larger, than the person who originally stitched it. So she has enlarged the dress with these panels on the side and on the center, Using what? Using uh, a bag of flour that's uh, like a UN issued bag of flour. And you can tell this by there's this the trace of a lily, the letter on the side there that tells you the sack that it was originally used on. So the very materiality of this land of UN Or maybe it's a But you can tell from that particular UN um, and response. That, that that's what this was. Uh, this is from Connected Online, which I should have you know, shared this story with us. So, um, and it's an amazing piece because of its very materiality. It speaks to the urgency of that situation and to the generosity of one woman to another in what was maybe the most difficult moment of their life. So these are things that are really important. The story of Jerusalem, the way back, we address this point by the Bethlehem community. Women and these amazing uh, Shakespeare dresses were worn in a particular way. You can see how she's doing it here. Um, they are looped up many times, like round the waist, and then tied in the back. And this produces pockets that are supposed to be pockets. And you can put in your vegetables, your baby, whatever you did, and carry, carry them around with you. So again, a very formal dress here, attesting to the kind of romantic lifestyle that is. Um, whereas other dresses attest to different relationships to um, the companies, where they make the fabrics from, how they're using the employer resources. So these, I really encourage you to get closer to get the dresses and to get up and look at the details of them. So this I mentioned before briefly is kind of all of the more um, recent versions of the employer resources. It's kind of like all. And this is something that also in this final section of the exhibition, which is thinking really about social and economic class and the broader relationship to class dynamics. So I was interested in who today gets to wear a on their body. It's usually something that is relatively expensive to buy, 
and is something that is brought a lot by tourists, by, um, by us basically, um, middle and upper class women who can, who can afford to have this kind of material. I was interested in understanding the problematics of embroidery as wear and sale today, which I'll talk about a little bit more, and in the history of socio-economic class and embroidery sort of going way back. So that's what's starting to, um, to be explored here. So this, uh, as I said, this last section is the kicking point in class. We've established that embroidery is a rural practice, right? So, um, so long, you know, if we go way back, uh, overnight Palestinians had more by the 19th century long adopted European uh, or Ottoman styles of dress. You can see evidence of that in many of these images. They nevertheless had a relationship to, to embroidery, often using this kind of Turkish Sadama style embroidery instead of uh, filehi cross stitch, or using embroidery in these more modern and contemporary ways. This is a set owned by a woman called Basma Kawad, who is from Nazareth. She bought this in Jerusalem on her honeymoon in 1921. And what you see is that it's very much this French cut silk shift dress with a little jacket over it. So very much in that French, you know, European mode, with this super delicate drama style embroidery made on top. And this tells us not only that there's this kind of internal market for embroidery catering to the upper classes as early as the 1910s and 20s, but that there's also this interest among those classes in engaging somehow with, with embroidery um, or with rural Palestinian embroidery. And you see this continue very much here, while uh, at the moment when increasingly you have these photographic studios being set up, particularly in Jerusalem, you get tourists, pilgrims, and upper class Palestinians coming in to have their picture taken in, uh, in the dress. So what's interesting about them is that of course they're very performative, they've got the job, they're meant to look like these sort of um, you know, Filehi and Pesky style characters. And they use some dresses that, that women would genuinely have made for themselves. So what was for one woman maybe the most important object she'd ever owned, the most important thing she'd ever made was for someone else a kind of costume to put on in auto-orientalizing play in this moment. So there's this really interesting sort of disparity between classes and their approach and connection to embroidery. Of course, those class issues carry over into the colonial context. In the 1910s and 20s, we have more and more pilgrims visitors coming into Palestine. Uh, both French and English, um, the Quakers, for instance, were a big group, many of them producing uh, bringing with them these kinds of pattern books and, uh, and other ways of producing embroidery. And DMC, Golfers and ABC, is this big thread company, this the biggest thread company working locally. And what they started to do in this period is bringing mechanically made thread to Palestine. And what's interesting about that is that on the one hand, it ended or it eroded a local practice. So previously, women had hand dyed on thread for their dresses. And often you will find that you might have 12 shades of red on a single garment because each time they dyed it, it came out a little different. And at the point where you could buy mechanically mixed thread, which was the same colour every time, of course many people did that, it's much easier. So this local practice sort of eroded, which is a way of shame. But on the other hand, such mechanically mixed thread produced a new kind of tradition in that women started to take up particular numbers of red thread, particular colour codes, as indicative of their natal village. So that, I don't know, Birzeit uh, would be DMC number 42 red, whatever it may be, and Dural would be something else, so learn something else, and so on and so forth. So that this really continues to this day. I think you can go to certain shops here or in and there, and you can be given the correct shade of thread based only on the name of your great-grandmother's natal village. So these sorts of um, introductions of material both changed local practice, but also contributed to the fossilization, the confirmation of particular kinds of local heritage and history in this moment, at a time when all of that village specificity was under threat. And I am from Brazil, and the DMC 42... Oh, no, no, I made that up, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I was just being, uh, being silly, but I would love I, to I know it. I go back with a story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd love to know what it is, I'm sorry. So we're going to move, um, move sort of this way, the last, uh, the last objects in this section are a little bit later from the 60s and 70s, looking at the 
this moment just after the establishment of these new organizations for embroidery production, trying to support more women after the Mecca. And founded usually by women of a certain class, either here or in Beirut. Many of them did really tireless work, but they also instituted new relationships and class dynamics in the production of embroidery. So what you see here is a particular kind of woman wearing a body dress. So these are made by an organization in the 60s and 70s. These are photos, amazing Polaroids taken in Ayakhenu, today one of the most dangerous uh, refugee camps in Lebanon, and one of some of the highest levels of poverty and toughest conditions. Women in Ayakhenu with these huge, like, crisp hairdos and massive, like, platform heels wearing this kind of modern embroidery made in the 70s. And what's amazing about them is that they really show who embroidery was being made for at this moment. For the modern Palestinian woman, young, beautiful, liberal, wealthy. And that's key, is that this is a moment in which the people who are actually stitching this embroidery tend to recede in the background and become the people who can no longer afford to wear it, honestly. And that's really this, that you look at these, these amazing historical pieces, things that women made for themselves and wore on their body, intimately connected to the histories of their own lives. And then you begin to understand embroidery is being more and more made by them for money, often very little, and worn on the bodies of women whose great-great-grandmothers were never worn embroidery, Palestinian embroidery in this way, because they were from this kind of urban elite. So these problematics are something very rarely talked about, but which I think are crucial to address. And that's also what I look at in this very last section. So this final part of the show is one that I urge you to spend a bit more time in. Um, these infographics are looking more closely at embroidery as a market and a commodity in its production today. Because now, having shifted definitively from this kind of personal mode, most embroidery that's produced is made by women for pay. And, uh, and embroidery organizations have really proliferated, especially in, uh, in the years since the rise of the net. What you find is that women are, are producing en masse and, and selling these things to organizations that attempt to find markets. And it was really important to me to understand this in terms of data on the one hand. So I did a survey of over 100 embroidery producing organizations and tried to study everything I could think of. Uh, when they were founded, who funds them, how they connected to international NGOs and different hands, um, how they're structured, what they pay women, what kind of embroidery they make, which camps do they work with, what kind of services do they offer their beneficiaries. And what I found is that this idea, this rhetoric, that's so common in NGO vocabulary of this idea of empowerment is deeply problematic and troubling. Right? We often talk about embroidery being a practice that empowers women today. But that empowerment is usually conflated with economy, right? with money, with giving them financial income, all of which is fine, but which rarely shifts the embedded power relations that actually contribute to someone's poverty. And as soon as you start to look at some of the statistics about how women work and the ways these organizations operate, it becomes difficult not to, to think critically about the ways that we consume this material. Okay? Embroidery is usually made by the piece and women are paid that way. So the faster you embroider, the more you're paid. But if, and you're, you always embroider at home because there are no running costs for the organization, right? They don't have to put you up, they don't need machines, you can be doing it at home. But if at the moment you have to look after your children or sick parents or you can't work for whatever reason, you're not, not going to earn any money. And this is a kind of deeply precarious industry where women are always fighting to be given enough work. Embroidery is a luxury product, it's sold for very high amounts of money, one of which is fine, it's handmade, it's you know, finely designed, whatever, it's, it involves a lot of labor, but it's not a growth market. This is something we buy occasionally, not all the time. So women are fighting for that sort of, uh, fighting for that market, operating in very precarious conditions, and in the end, earning very little. On average, women earn about 10 to 25% of what you pay for a product. So if you buy a bag for $50, she's earning five to $12.50 for what might be a week's of work. And of course, organizations offer different benefits to their beneficiaries and the people that they work with. Education, literacy, vocational training, child support, and all these things are good. No one is getting individually wealthy of these uh, practices. But nevertheless, I think it can be very difficult to talk about these things 
because embroidery has been so politicized and celebrated in Palestinian culture as something inherent to heritage, to, to love them. And because these are criticisms that you can make about almost any NGO language. But when it comes to embroidery, it's much harder to criticize. If you're going to criticize ceramics or woodworks or some other kind of industry, it's easier because it doesn't carry this kind of extra political weight. So trying to talk and address these kinds of problematics has been uh, the most challenging and sort of important foundational elements of this project. But the last piece in the exhibition is a little bit more uplifting. And I'm just going to speak of what I'm going to say a couple of sentences about this. But I wanted to finish with this, and it's a kind of high point of the show alongside our film, which is uh, an edit of all of those interviews I did with women across uh, Lebanon, Palestine, and Jordan. We follow, we follow five particular stories through this. Rashi stress is something I came across in this research. And what's amazing about it is that at first glance, nothing about it is Palestine. And these colours are not particularly traditionally Palestinian. You won't see a lot of green or, uh, or light, light pink is what you here. Uh, the cut isn't technically really traditional or historic. They know the use of beads, they know the all over layout of the pattern. I mean, nothing about it, technically, is Palestinian. If you're thinking about it from this kind of purist <laughs> point of view. And yet, by virtue of being made by Asia and worn on her body, it is just as Palestinian as any of the hundreds of historic dresses in this ex exhibition. And to come back to what I was saying right at the beginning about embroidery transforming and, and changing the life of its wearer, it seems to me that this dress represents the fact that embroidery too is transforming and mutating uh, in a positive way, maybe away from certain kinds of traditions, into a future that reflects the economic, political, social, cultural realities of the women that come.